As we continue our study of the letters to the seven churches, letters of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, to his church, I am pleased to welcome now my good buddy, John Micah Richardson. Uh, John Micah, thank you for agreeing yes, to be thank you. part of this important study series that's a companion piece to what we're doing with the 2015 uh, Lipscomb <clears throat> Lectures. But before you preach to us, uh, would you tell us just a little bit about your background? Where'd you grow up, go to school? Yes, I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, father has preached in the Church of Christ for 50 years, so I'm mm -hmm. well acquainted with our tribe and uh, the Church of Christ in general. Um, I had a, a bit of a, a calling. I felt like at a young age, and I always wanted to be a preacher like my dad, or at least in ministry. And at some point, um, kind of lost that uh, desire. And uh, my Tarshish happened to be Middle Tennessee State University, where I pursued graphic design for a year. Um, but during that time, um, the call began to come back, and um, or it may have always been there that I had just been ignoring. And um, went to Abilene Christian uh, to pursue a degree in youth ministry. Okay. Spent two years at Abilene Christian University and um, under Robert, Ogles Robert Oglesby uh, in youth ministry. Um, was married, and uh, my wife, after she graduated, we moved back to Nashville, and I finished uh, my undergraduate work here at Lipscomb University. So that's where I did most of my undergrad. And where have you been serving in ministry recently? Well, I have been in youth ministry for the last 17 years here in Middle Tennessee. Um, I served with the Northside Congregation in Nashville for almost nine years. Um, was with the Madison Church of Christ for another three, and I've been at the Hendersonville Congregation here locally, um, just north of Nashville for the last seven years uh, in the youth ministry role. Well, I know that uh, in times of transition, you've done some preaching. Yes. And, and I assume that that's something you look to uh, the future as a, as, a, as a part of your calling. Yes, sir. Talk to me just a little bit about why you would want to preach. I know you said your dad was a preacher, but, but for you, where did, where did that calling come from? Um, as you said, we've, we've been in a quite a bit of uh, transition at our church for the last few years, and which has opened up doors for me to be able to preach more often mm -hmm. um, in and out of the pulpit. And at that point in time, realized that that calling was still there. Um, so the more that I felt that, the more that I was uh, in the process of preparing and preaching, uh, the more that fire began to light back up inside of me, which is really what led to wanting to come back here and pursue the um, MDF here, here at Lipscomb. Um, what I have found is I've worked with youth ministry. I've worked in youth ministry for 17 years, so I've, I've worked with students, which I love students. But the more, the older I have become, the more I realize I want their parents. And I know that from certainly from a preaching perspective, it's not just for the adults, but I realize that my audience will shift. Um, and I, um, I love the local church. That's one of the things that I think my father did instill in me quite a bit, certainly the other mentors that I have had. Mm -hmm. um, very passionate about the local church and what is happening with her in our community. So um, there's, that's part of the, one of the biggest reasons I'm, I'm drawn to this role is how can I help the local church? Yeah. So what I hear you describing is uh, maybe something like Jeremiah's fire in his bones. Okay, wow. Uh, Scary, that, but yes. That you can't, you can't hold back. When, when you're preaching, yes, sir. What, what do you enjoy most about the act, or the ministry of preaching? Um, well, um, I have become, uh, right now I'm enjoying the, um, the process before preaching more than okay. anything else. Right. The, the study, the spiritual formation that takes place. Yes, sir. Um, the spiritual formation that takes place because of that discipline while you're studying. I ha I've, for example, with Revelation, this is the first time I've been able to plunge into Revelation like I have um, and completely mm -hmm. frustrated that I've never plunged in before. Mm -hmm. and so part of the preaching for myself is what I get from the preparation and then the excitement of being able to deliver that back out to the people once I've been in that world uh, that's imagined by the text itself. So um, it's, it's a joy to bring that back out to others. Yeah. Wrestling with the text yes. and, and, yes. and enjoying the the unexpected uh, blessings that emerge from that process. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I yes, know sir. What you mean? Well, uh, before we get you up before us, uh, give us just a preview of what you're going to be talking about today. Uh, my pericope happens to be Revelation chapter three, uh, verses one through six, and it is the letter to Sardis, um, probably the most harsh uh, letter of the seven. Um, there's no uh, commendation, which I'll talk about in my uh, lesson, but um, it's a very blunt letter. Uh, so I wasn't quite sure what I would be getting into as I studied for this, mm -hmm. but uh, that's where I'll be. It's a very, re very relevant letter to churches today. Well, as the text says over and over again, uh, 
let those of us who hear uh, hear the word of Christ to the church today. So we're thankful that you're going to bring that to us. Yes, now. sir. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Uh, stand with me and listen to Jesus Himself. Um, the voice we will hear in this text. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter three, verses one through six, out of the NRSV. That's Revelation chapter three, one through six. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. For the last month, I have been living, or at least attempting to live in and listen to, the world imagined by the letter of Revelation. Um, a strange letter. Um, a letter unlike any of its New Testament colleagues. A letter dictated by Jesus himself. A message for the bride from her bridegroom. A letter often seen as too controversial, severe, and subversive. A letter often deemed too unreasonable for anyone then, 2,000 years ago, or now, attempting to be at peace with the ambitions or desires of the surrounding urban cultures. Because that's what we're called to do, right? to live sacrificially, uh, to be unlike culture around us, to hold fast to what is good, to extend hospitality even to our enemies, to love relentlessly, to bless those that curse us, to live at peace with everyone. Peace? Everyone? Shalom. Is, is that even possible in our current surrounding hostile culture? So while strolling through this world imagined by Revelation, I kept listening, and I kept looking for, for something new. I kept waiting for the aha moment that eventually hits anyone studying to deliver a message or to preach a sermon, that moment when it all happens to make sense, the moment the text slaps you in the face or kills you, as one of our professors says here at Lipscomb. Then it dawned on me. What I was looking for and listening for was there. Right there. Right here. I mean directly in front of me, staring me down the entire time. I could feel it. Smell and taste it. I was breathing its air and walking in its streets. And at, at that exact moment, Asia Minor no longer seemed so distant. Sardis no longer felt smelled or tasted like some foreign city or culture that I had to wait on an archaeologist to dig up and explain. Walk with me for a moment. Imagine a region, a region not unlike the provinces of Roman-occupied Asia Minor, shaped and molded by the Greco-Roman powers that be. Some might call it one of the most significant regions in the United States of America. Lush and green, Attractive, yet simple. A place to raise a family. The cost of living is tangible here. The South Central region that is filled with distinguished cities. Significant cities. Historic cities. Rich with art and music. Cities with extravagance and splendor. And we, like the followers of the Lamb who once walked the streets of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, Thyteria and Sardis, we walk the streets of Memphis and Nashville and Huntsville and Birmingham. And we're 
well more than familiar with the Western American culture that looms over us and attempts to shape every aspect of us, but we believe we have a handle on it. Sure, the temples and secularism look different than that of Asia Minor, but we have our icons. We handle the currency. We're aware of the empire's inscriptions on our lives, so to speak. Now, do me a favor and zero in a little bit more. Let's make it a little bit more familiar. Picture an area abundant with resources. A land adorned with rolling hills and fertile valleys. Rich in heritage, culture, and scenic beauty. They say Middle Tennessee is God's country. Provides genuine southern hospitality and delivers unparalleled creative music experiences. Take even a closer look. A region often called the Bible Belt. An area known for the smorgasbord of churches offered on every street corner. A place where conservative values play an important role in society and politics. Christian attendance across the denominations are said to be higher here than the nation's average. That makes us happy, doesn't it? We like that statistic. Apparently, we must be doing something right in the Bible Belt. After all, people attend Sunday morning, they come back Sunday night, and they even come back for Wednesday services. Sure, there are temptations around us. We have temples here in the Bible Belt. We have stadiums and sports teams and celebrities that compete for our time and attention. We even have the Mother Church of Country Music, the Grand Ole Opry and a television show named Nashville that's not even filmed here. Hmm. Nashville. Easy, John Micah. That's a little too close to home. Let's parallel Sardis and Nashville a little bit. Sardis, one of the most powerful cities of the ancient world, once the capital of the kingdom of Lydia. Nashville, the capital city of the state of Tennessee, the second largest city in Tennessee. Sardis, a busy center of trade and traffic. Nashville, the center of health care, publishing, banking, Transportation industries and the rising food scene often featured on the Food Network, not to mention numerous colleges and universities. Sardis, a city of wealth, fame, and claimed to be one of the first to discover the art of dyeing wool. Nashville, the home of country music, the home of many record labels and artists. And the church. What about the church? In Sardis. Our city is cutting edge and trendy. Shouldn't our church reflect that same culture? Located in the Bible Belt of Asia Minor with the other six churches addressed by Jesus through John. Oh, the church in Sardis had acquired a name. Its reputation as a vibrant progressive church had likely spread far and wide. They would have written books and offered solutions and models for other churches hoping to be like them. They were a resource. Well regarded in the city and the neighborhood. Probably quite large for those days. And their attendance was remarkable. And they likely had the most current and relevant programming. Well admired by others. Dynamic. No shortage of money, talented staff, or resources. No issues with false doctrines or abandoning their first love like Ephesus or Pergamum, Thyteria, or the lukewarm Laodicea. Well, thank goodness we don't have their problems. Their elders, their staff. Can you imagine how frustrating it must be to work in those churches with those people? Yet Jesus himself offers little commendation. I'm sure the diagnosis given to the church in Sardis came as a shock. In fact, the reality of Sardis' condition couldn't have been more startling. Jesus says, I know your works. I know the real you. Like a wife who knows her husband better than anyone else does, you have a reputation of being alive. On the outside, it looks like things are going well. It looks like you're healthy. And if you, you appear to be vibrant, But you were dead, a corpse, the walking dead, if you will. I imagine hearing those words for the first time left them completely stunned. Did he 
Did he just, did John just say that we were dead? Did he say that Sardis was in danger of having our name, Sardis' name, blotted out of the book of life? Is that possible? They probably all stopped and looked at each other as they heard the diagnosis. The elders pointed at the ministers. The ministers pointed at the deacons. The deacons pointed back at the elders and so on. Were they expecting something different? Did they become defensive at John's disapproval of their Christian lifestyle? Did they ask John if they got their mail mixed up? Surely you meant to send this to one of the other churches in the Bible Belt of Asia Minor, not us. Would they have believed it? Us? Sardis? Are you kidding, John? Let's, let's rethink this. Check your bag one more time. Do you have the right letter? Have you seen our new AV equipment? Those are brand new projectors. Did you check our attendance records? John, we had 400 children at VBS last week. You have got to have the wrong church. So Sardis, coming so completely to terms with its pagan environment, and although it retained an outward appearance of life, was spiritually bankrupt. And Jesus says, although you have the appearance of life, you couldn't be farther from it. Seduced and surrounded and confronted with beautiful allurement and benefits of paganism, Sardis, once a cutting-edge, influential church, hmm, had no idea that she had been laying in a hospice bed all these years. They had a reputation, a name, and appeared to be doing well. They were so seduced by individualism and consumerism that they were more concerned about branding themselves and their image as the model church than they were with branding the image of Jesus Christ. As if they were competing. As if they were competing for church of the year. As if they had completely forgotten that they were the church and in doing so became the first church to master doing church. They simply could not see past their own inflated reputation. However, following the most harsh indictment of the seven churches, like a bridegroom pleading with his bride over their vows, I made a commitment to you. You made a commitment to me through sickness and health and even death. Jesus doesn't give up. He doesn't walk away or hang his head in defeat. Rather, he pleads with Sardis. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is on the verge of death. It's, it's not too late. I want this to work out between us. Can you hear the voice of Jesus? Can you imagine the bridegroom on his knees pleading with her? Sardis. Sardis. Oh, oh my sweet Sardis. Even though I have found your works incomplete and unfinished in my father's eyes, oh, oh my precious Sardis. Remember who you are. Remember. Remember what we had. Don't be seduced by the values and propaganda of this culture and the empire that looms over you. That same culture that discriminates, thrives on injustice, and wants you to embrace all of its toxic values. It will be the end of you. Remember the Holy Spirit you received. Remember what you heard regarding this relationship. Retrace your steps, Sardis. Hear my voice, Sardis. Hold fast, Sardis. Return to me. You don't have much time. What happened? How, how could this happen? How could this happen in Sardis? Well, we all often love to watch drama unfold, don't we? Partly because of our infatuation with reality television, we often love to watch drama unfold right before our eyes. Partly because we're curious. Partly because we want to know what not to do ourselves. I like to call it spiritual rubbernecking. You know, it's like rubbernecking past a horrific accident. Or maybe one that's not so horrific. We want to get a glimpse. But we're also glad that it wasn't us. And often after passing, hmm, after seeing the carnage, we seldom even remember what had occurred. But we want to know. We want to know the details. Well, we don't have all the specifics about what happened at Sardis. 
But we know this. Relationships don't deteriorate overnight. Cultural assimilation isn't instantaneous. Transformation takes time. It's a slow process. It comes with long-term exposure to temptation and seduction. It was as if Sardis herself bent down to get a drink of water from the river of Pactolus, only to find herself enamored with what she saw. Her own breath taken away by the very image of her own magnificence and splendor, basking in her own significance, her accomplishments, her arrivals as one of the most popular churches in the Bible Belt of Asia Minor. Her own reflection was too much. She fell in love with herself. Unable to leave the image of beauty in her reflection, she drowned. Fixated more on herself and her achievements over the years and what she used to be, she missed the warnings, she dismissed the red flags, and culture had taken over her. But not all of her. There was still hope. You see, there in Sardis existed a remnant. A few were still engaged in the ministry of Jesus. A few who had not yet soiled their clothes with the stains of culture. A few righteous that still walked with Jesus. A few still allowing the Holy Spirit to shape and guide them. A few still committed to the groom. A few still holding fast to the vows they once made. A few whose worthiness just might help breathe life back into the entire body at Sardis. The few who hadn't tolerated a minimalist understanding of faith. The few who hadn't played down the implications of keeping their vows with Jesus. The few who hadn't become lazy and consumed with themselves. The vital few were the reason that Sardis had any life left in them at all. It's not all that uncommon, is it? We hear stories in churches and amongst our friends and families about unfaithfulness. We hear about relationships dissolving all the time. We're often drawn to it, right? Oh, I don't, I don't mean that, that we're drawn to the heartbreak in our own families or with our friends, but we love to watch it. Disguised as healthy matchmaking, we love to see who hooks up with who and who will get the rose or who won't, which is even more proof that the surrounding culture is having its way with us now. Instead of being heartbroken and appalled over it, it becomes the topic of our conversation. Throughout the week, it consumes us. It weakens us. We tweet about it. Slowly but surely, it whispers. It whispers a different message into our ears. Yes, culture seductively says, whoever has ears, let them hear what we have to say to you. And our churches, they make the headlines too. All too often, they become the topic, a sad topic, we hear of doors closing year after year of local work. Our sweet churches. We hear of churches dying more and more frequently. Of course, they die from different complications and illnesses and various terminal diseases. But in many cases, there always seems to be the few. The vital few. Rather, in all dying churches, they all face the same problem. It seems like 20% of the members are responsible for 80% of the work. At least, that's what the experts have come to realize through countless autopsies of hundreds of dead churches. There were always a few, but they cannot do it by themselves. The few in Sardis, the handful of members who are described as wearing white, the few in Sardis who are described as worthy, the few in Sardis who held up the name of Jesus as an image of health, as an image of vitality, as an image of life, Sardis, if you become like them, the few in your church who have become marginalized, forgotten, taken advantage of in our churches who walk in righteousness, the few who are fully awake, the few who do remember, the few who are alive and well because of their faith and their works go hand in hand. But the few are often overlooked, underrated, and dare I say, the unpaid of our churches. If you pay closer attention to the few, the few who have not become complacent and who care more about others than their own reputations, I, Jesus, will confess your name as my bride before my Father. So let's finish this walk. 
Not through Sardis, but through our own regions and our own churches. And don't worry, I don't have any intentions of paralleling any specific church here in Nashville, or the Bible Belt for that matter, of which I belong to and draw a salary from. As we walk, I can see, hear, and smell the same toxic air that Sardis breathed. The same air that, in fact, all the churches of Asia Minor breathed. I'm reminded that our mission is enormous and less daunting when I remember that we're in this together. But as I walked through Sardis, the message seemed all too realistic to me. The more, or I'm, I'm more familiar with the sights and the sounds and the smells of the local church. To be honest, one of the reasons this message is eerie or prophetic is that I too have looked into that pool or into that mirror and seen Sardis in me. Concerned about my own reputation or my image or my influence, I feel the presence of culture regularly pressing in on me and the church body that I serve. I need these messages. Why does the letter of Sardis seem so relevant? I assume it's because as church leaders, we have a great responsibility on our hands to help nurture the bride of Christ. We must hold each other accountable and pay attention to the reality of our church's well-beings. May we be people who remember what we have received and heard. May we lead people to walk with Jesus. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is still saying to the churches. Amen. John Micah, thank you for uh, bridging the gap between ancient Sardis and the world in which we want to be the church of Jesus Christ. You know, there's that great line in there I've always wanted to use in the middle of a sermon, and Jesus is not afraid to use it. Wake up. Mm. <laughs> But uh, I think you woke us up, or you used scripture to, to really invigorate us to a new way of imagining uh, just how much Jesus is invested mm. in his church after all. So talk, talk to us about that a little bit. And where did you get that image of the bridegroom going to the bride and saying, here are the vows that we made and, and entreating her? Talk, talk to me a little bit about where that came to you. I honestly think a lot of it is deep-seated. I think that, as I said, being a preacher's kid, but also being aware of what my father was concerned about, always being concerned about the bride of Christ mm -hmm. and the things that he told me never to involve myself in um, so, so as not to hurt the bride of Christ. Okay. So part of that is, is, is a passion inside of me that when I see the church, I see her as this bride, which is something that's very special to any yeah. of us who are married, who knows what that is. Um, so um, the pleading hearing the tenderness the tenderness that Jesus has yeah. with this church who yeah. he who he does not want to lose um, this wasn't a message of um, I can't wait to get rid of you I'm ready to divorce you or I'm ready to be done with you you're making me sick it was I want you back I want this to work mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and I think as I imagined that I imagined a tenderness of his voice I, I didn't imagine him screaming at them or it was it was a gentle but but yet firm this, is, this has got to change. So yeah. that's, that's where much of that came from. A lot of there's, there's a lot back in there. Um, um, being concerned about marriages and being concerned about families in general, but always seeing the church in relation to Jesus as the bride is where, that's one of the first things that spoke to me when I began taking notes on this was, this is a, this is a bridegroom who yeah. is pleading with his bride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and is passionately in love with his bride. So mm -hmm. that's where that's where it, I believe that's where it emerged from. Well, it certainly partakes of, of the biblical language mm -hmm. of, of the bridegroom. I remember the time they came to Jesus. They said, "John the Baptist, uh, his his folks uh, aren't uh, aren't so celebratory. They fast all the time, and mm -hmm. and and why don't uh, your disciples fast?" And Jesus says, "Well, when the bridegroom is with us, it's mm -hmm. not a time of fasting." So so that that combination of, of tender love and celebration and just intimate commitment between Jesus and his church. I, I love the way you, well, you And it's a mystery too, right? That's the way Paul describes it. Yep. I mean, it is this mystery that, um, and that's pretty much all he says, but he, when he describes the husband and the wife relationship and talking about what that looks like with Jesus and his own church, mm -hmm. you can't help but see mm -hmm. 
yeah. importance and how different things would be if we if we felt that way as a church and if we talked to our people that way as a church and if we really let them know how important they were to Jesus as a church, yeah, as a bride. Yeah, yeah. I think it's powerful. Uh, Jesus speaks to this church about their reputation. Of course, we do well to take seriously the reputation that a church family has in any community, but it sounds to me like uh, that, that maybe they were a little too worried about their branding mm -hmm. and, and not as much uh, connected to just the, their master. Is that, is that a problem you think churches have today in terms of identity? I think, um, I think, I'm not sure how to say this globally. I know that within our tribe, I see the identity crisis that we've been walking through for years mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so that's been part of the struggle. But I do. I think it's certainly depending on where you are, which cities and which regions you're in, certainly with, with this text. These churches were important, but they weren't the only churches in that area. Um, but there was something to having that reputation. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, I, I think that we do struggle with this. I know that I serve in a church where we struggle with this. I think that you have history, and I think that you have um, some baggage that goes with that, of, what, of the way things used to be, and struggling with what our identity is now. Uh, absolutely. I think, I think it's something that we must be aware of. Um, I think young preachers or preachers in general get caught up in this. Um, I believe so. Yeah. I think you've given us a, a good opportunity to rethink that and just look very <clears throat> self-critically and honestly at each other and saying, what is, what is our reputation in this community? Where does that reputation draw from? What, what face do we hold up? Yeah, and, and their the reputation was good. Sardis had a good reputation yeah. in the neighborhood, but that was, uh, that was the point they were missing. That's, that's what they were concerned with yeah. versus what they should have been concerned yeah. about. Well, we're almost out of time, but, but it, the, let's close with this question, if, if, if you will. If a church today, and, and we hope that our churches do hear this as Christ's word to them, to yes. us. yes. What does a church who's trying to take this letter seriously look like? What practical things should we look for, pray for, ask God to develop in us mm. so that we can learn the lessons that Jesus wanted to teach this church? Well, Dr. Durham, I, th I think first off as church leaders, uh, whether it's shepherds or ministers or whatever that staff looks like, I think that there is a diligence that we must have um, when it comes to being proactive about examining our church bodies. Um, I think we, we can go along and never really look at it, but I think given a letter like this and, and the conclusion, or we don't know the conclusion. Well, we, we know Sardis is gone at this point, um, but um, we must look at the reality of our church's well-being and health. And so we must, I, I think that we must be proactive about examining that. And how to do that is another question altogether. Ask um, tough questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ourselves. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I think we um, must undergo routine spiritual physicals, if you will. I'm not mm -hmm. really sure what that looks like yet, but whether it's from month to month or year to year, um, I think the, um, the danger is letting too much time pass and assuming that we are who we say we are. Yeah. Yeah. So um, okay. there must be some routine scheduled maintenance that we as leadership take a critical look into who we are yeah. and to why we are, I believe. Good word for us. I thank you, John Micah, for uh, helping us use our God-given <laughs> imaginations to place ourselves back within the text and to hear what Jesus is saying Thank to you. the church then and to the church today. Thank you. Thank you, Appreciate brother. It. Thanks. Okay. Love you.